Hi everyone, I'm Don Rooney. And I'm John Timpain. Welcome to the Musical Inner Two, the podcast born out of a mistake. We once meant to introduce a soothing musical interlude, but we said soothing musical inner tube and the name stuck. On this podcast, we talk to interesting people about their interesting lives, jobs, hobbies, and passions. Difference makers who really make a difference. We welcome to the musical inner tube today, Joy Stocky, a great friend of the podcast and a poet, fiction writer, essayist, consultant, publisher, and so many other things. Among her books are a travel memoir, Anatolian Days and Nights, and a splendid, delicious cookbook, Tree of Life, Turkish Home Cooking. That's right. Joy is also a world-class chef, and today we'll be mixing and matching holiday recipes. Welcome again to the musical inner tube Joy Stocky. Thank you. Happy to be back with you guys. Yeah. Hey, it's great that you're here. Now, heading into the holidays, we thought we'd have you back to help people who are going to be entertaining for the holidays have some lovely and wonderful food to put out. And the first holiday we're encountering as we go through the calendar is Halloween. People do entertain at Halloween, and usually they make pretty gory stuff, you know, little, little sandwiches that look like fingers and, you know, other things that look like eyeballs. We thought we might class it up a little bit with uh, with some offerings that you might suggest. Well, I can say all of this goes with the Halloween eyeballs, which I loved as a kid, the peeled grapes guys, if anybody remember those. And yeah. you have to be blindfolded, then you dig your hand in the bowl, right? Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's along with the spaghetti for the intestines. So, that's right. Um, to go and with the some cauliflower of those... for the brain. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're having fun now. Um, so I thought I would share something that could be made ahead for either those of us who are handing out candy are those of us who are trick-or-treating or those of us who have a bunch of little kids who are running around and we're starving. So my thought was we all know this particular food, pot roast, and the cut of meat for a pot roast, which is a brisket, which is a relatively inexpensive cut of meat. But I thought we would really make it since this is also the Day of the Dead for many people which is a holiday I hold near and dear since I spend a lot of time in Mexico. And so I am suggesting we do something called birria. And this is my friend Judy Castro's recipe. And Judy is a chef in a place called Cabo Pomo, Baja Sur, in uh, Baja Sur, California, north of Cabo San Lucas. And it's down a dirt road. So there is no nightlife here, guys, except the Splendid stars. So, birria, what is that? Um, Anybody who's made a brisket, it's slow-cooked meat, and it can be stewed all afternoon. You can make it the day before. It's a traditional Mexican stew, and it's from the state of Jalisco, which is in the mainland, and it's made from slow-cooked meat. And originally, this is a very old um, recipe. I mean, it comes from basically the Colombian exchange and throughout any part of the world where people had meat that they needed to cook during the day or leave, slow-cooked old goat, lamb, beef, mainly lamb and goat were the original um, meats for this. And they're delicious if you like that sort of thing. Um, But that was what people had. And so what you did is you would possibly dig a hole in the ground you would put charcoals, maybe you had a fire overnight, you'd put the coals in, you'd put a pot with seasoned meat, and when you came back at the end of the day, you would have tender meat that you could eat. So that's kind of the concept of this. In Jalisco, they braise the meat. Braising is when you cook over a long, slow heat. They braise the meat in a chili broth. And what I like about this recipe, you can make it spicy or you can make it mild. So basically, it's grandma's pot roast, um, Jalisco style. And what Judy likes to do with it, and what I think is really fun, is you shred it. And you have this flavorful shredded meat and this lovely uh, tomato uh, 
pepper sauce that's been stewed and you serve it with uh, tortillas. And, oh. Right? You shred it, yeah. you put it on a tortilla, and you can do flour or corn, depending on your preference. And then you can have all kinds of side dishes with it, whatever you like. Guacamole, sour cream, cilantro, limes, limes for sure, um, queso. And, you know, in Mexico, you would have queso fresco. You'd have, or you could just really make it simple and just do cheddar cheese, right? And, yeah. and grate it on top and make it yeah. super simple. Um, onions, chopped onions, sauteed onions. So you can have a lot of fun with this dish. And kids love it. So um, uh, the main thing with that you want with this are chilies. So where the heck do you get these chilies, right? The three that we use are um, guajillo, ancho, and arbol. Guajillo, which are one of my favorites, they're sort of sweet and smoky, and anchos are smoky, and our bowls are hot. So this is a recipe you could leave out the our bowl chilies if you wanted. So are three dried chilies, and basically you would um, put them in a blender with tomatoes, onions, aromatics, and you put them in a blender, and then you pour that on top of the meat, and you braise the meat in your oven at a low temperature, 250, 300 um, you could do it in a slow cooker if you like to use a slow cooker. I am I'm old school. I do it in my oven. And you can make it the day before. You can make it two days before. You could even make it three days before. <laughs> and so, you know, you've gone to work all day. You're hosting a part, not even hosting a party. Your kids are going out trick-or-treating or your friends have nothing to do. And they're like, hey, let's hand out candy together. And uh, you're like, sure, I made birria. So... Um, there you go. That would be my suggestion. And it's delicious and it freezes well. So you could even make it weeks ahead. Now, now let me ask you a question real quick. Birria, how's that spelled? B-I-R-R-I-A. Birria. Very close to burial, which is exactly what we're looking for. So I like that. <laughs> hey, whoa. I didn't even think of that one. So a uh, question here. All right. So I find I love... I like corn tortillas more than the flour kind, but I find that the flour tortillas stand up better when you put hot food in them. What's your sense? Well, you know what um, they do in Mexico? They use two tortillas, two corn tortillas, oh, mm-hmm. right? Because uh-huh. you're right. Oh. It's, it doesn't have the gluten in it, so it breaks and it absorbs. So what you do is you layer one on top of the other. And who doesn't like that? Why didn't I think of that? Why not? Yes. And you know, Birria, I mean, it is this uh, on the West Coast and and the Southwest. It's this huge, exploding thing. I mean, everybody's talking about it. Yeah, I I haven't seen it so much on this coast yet. We're we're talking from the East Coast uh, listeners, but birria is on everyone's lips, and so is beer. But uh, it just <laughs> seems like there's so many ways you could take this. And you could make so many different things. You could make it a big sort of, as you said, it could be like mom's pot roast where you, you know, you've got yeah. potatoes yeah. on the side and, and salad and, uh, even things like green beans. It, it, it really is up to you. I love this. You know, one thing I want to add, you don't have to shred it. You could slice it like grandma's pot roast. So you could do it that you way. You want to be thin slices to fit in the, you know, I mean, to make a nice bed in the uh, tortillas, wouldn't it? But say you wanted to do it with fried potatoes or something, mm. or potatoes, you could just serve. You could serve it like grandma's pot roast. Just mix it up with beans, and um, I'm always good for a good green bean casserole. Maybe I'll figure mm. out how to kind of spice up a green bean casserole as long as we have the fried onion thingies. On yeah. Top. All right. So that's Joy's birria, and um, you will be able to find the entire recipe on our web page and please uh have at it and yeah. let us know how it, it works it i i am so hungry having listened to joy i can hardly get to this next <laughs> bit i'm supposed to talk about something that i made for friends um this spring which it's savory pumpkin souffle and i'm not really my mouth is just watering over these these are <laughs> the these are really good it's really just souffle with canned packed pumpkin added. 
Uh, you can make it so there's very little sugar in it if you don't want sugar. This is meant to be a savory dish, the one I'm going to describe. And again, we'll put the recipe on our website. Uh, my recipes are, are wildly approximate, but I think this is right. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> 15 bowls of. No, but here, here are the ingredients. Uh, I think most of my listeners will know how to make a souffle, but we'll start out with the basics. First of all, you're going to need some butter and m- maybe a little uh, olive oil. I like to combine the two when we get started. And you probably should have at least one medium shallot. Shallots are really interesting. More and more people are turning to them instead of onion uh, in the belief that the shallot has somewhat uh, a sweeter, uh, not overwhelming flavor, and they cook really readily. They they don't really take much time, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to dice the shallot, put it into the mix, and it's going to give structure and a little uh, savory overtone to it. So 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 far we have butter, oil, shallot. Now we're going to have we're going to, I'm going to give you a recipe for flour using flour, but you could also use something. Uh, there are other, um, things that could be used, uh, to make this rise and use your own recipe and just, just throw in some pumpkin. But basically what we have here for the, the roux, which is the basis of the, uh, the rising part is we're going to have only three tablespoons of flour. We're going to have about three quarters of a cup of milk. Um, I uh seven large eggs and if that's too much you could you could do it with just egg whites. Wow. Uh well eggs are are sort of the 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 heart and soul of a souffle. I would guess, yeah. Yeah. Uh you want to have seven a, of them. Yeah. Maybe heart, soul <laughs> and several other organs. <laughs> now you can do this a couple of different ways. You could do a quarter of a teaspoon of cream of tartare. You could also do about the same amount uh, of uh Cornstarch, it's, it's up to you. Um, so we have, so far we have butter, shallot, flour, milk. Um, we have the, uh, oh, now, now and, and we've had the cream, cream of tartare ne- and the eggs. Okay, now the next part of it is you will also have on hand about a cup and a third to a cup and a half of cheese. And it's up to you what kind you want. It could be cheddar. It could be Gouda. It could be Gouda. It could be... Gruyere, yeah, uh, all of those are traditional cheeses to use in soufflés. You could use another kind, Wensleydale. <laughs> you know, okay, it's, Thursday Dale. <laughs> it's a little, a little runny, but it's all we have right now. This is from the Monty Python cheese sketch, exactly. Um, and I, and another joke that I told once is Gouda cheese is any kind of cheese you like. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly right. You know, you can really, put that in. and Gouda is good in in and and you want to shred that. You want to use a grater to just get it nice in nice shreds. It seems to work. You know, I don't like to really powder uh, the the cheese, and I also don't find that in making. Yeah, you, know, you know, your mileage may differ, but I don't. I don't think that you want to just dice the cheese up. I I feel better about shredding. It seems to work better for me anyway. Two thirds of a cup of solid packed pumpkin. Ugh. Now, what what makes this savory? Well, we've already mentioned the um, shallots. The main spices will be salt, pepper, and sage. Nice. And there's going to be about a teaspoon of sage. So that's going to get a good shot of sage. Now, those of you who've made souffle know what the, know what the drill is. I recommend having mixed the f- souffle up that you serve this in, in ramekins, yep. right? The little, the little, uh, ceramic dishes instead of serving a big old, Souffle, but I think this would work well in a in a big souffle pan. It will not rise real high, but it will rise enough. It'll rise enough, and it looks great. So basically, you cook the shallots. That takes about five minutes until they look they look soft and a little translucent. Uh, then then we get to work, folks. Uh, we make our roux, which is with the the. Uh, so that's going to be with a little bit more butter. And the three tablespoons of flour, and you mix that up until it's kind of a paste. And you can you can cook it a little longer than you might cook a roux. I like to get a kind of a toasty roux going. Then we add the milk little by little, stirring all the time. Add the egg mixture little by little until we have a, a, a until we got it going. 
and you throw that cream of tartar in, and then the pièce de résistance is the shredded cheese, last but not least. And then you you stir all this up until it's a really nice colloidal mixture, and then you uh, <laughs> you pour it into. How did you like that? Did that you was like great. That? that was good. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, colloidal. We do not hear that word no. enough on our show. I have and there so, are reasons for I that. Have to look it, it up. Yes, there are. It's just a ridiculous <laughs> word. I'm and looking no one it ever up right now. It. I really am. A colloid is a, uh, a colloid is a liquid in which uh, all of the solids yeah. in the liquid are uh, uh, evenly dispersed. It's a great so, word. For example, it's a really yeah, great so word. So mud is a kind of colloid. Thank uh, but you. Don't put that in here. <laughs> uh, so it sounds agree. disgusting, John, but thank yeah. you. you I was betcha. kind of anyway, mixing it up so, with colitis, but that's okay. I couldn't Colitis resist. is not, that's <laughs> not good. I know. Why, no. why do we take, okay. So, so, okay. Well, as we were saying, <laughs> um, <laughs> you, the, the, uh, the thing I forgot to mention is that you split the eggs between, um, the, the yolks and the whites. And then you put the yolks in there and then you beat the whites up until they are fluffy, but not, not dry, you know, so they, it's forming stiff peaks and not dry. And then you fold them in. Don't stir them in, fold in the peaks. And this will include, this will increase the size of the colloid by, you know, maybe about half really. So when you got it all done, you, you, you have your ranikins or your, uh, your large, uh, souffle pan, which of course, you know, liberally buttered, put them in there. Uh, I would say 18 to 20 minutes, maybe. What temperature, you know, maybe, John? 350? Uh, 350. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the world is 350. Yeah, kind of. Yes. Three, yeah. You know, we're not, we're not, um, uh, what you're looking for is for it to start browning because they'll, they'll rise a little bit. Mm -hmm. And just when they start, you know, it, they really look appetizing, look almost like if you've had pumpkin biscuits. Yeah, they start to separate a little bit yeah. and rise. So, and that's it. It's it's um, the main thing is to gently fold them egg whites in, which is the step that I mentioned uh, did not mention first. And uh, uh, it's it's delicious. It's a great uh, first course. It's not really a dessert because it's it's savory and not sweet. But the pumpkin does impart a lovely, unexpected pumpkin flavor. Yeah, and uh, I must say, savory pumpkin is a good thing. Think. Think uh, pumpkin pie without the sweetness, but with the added uh, texture of of uh, of you know the those beautiful shallots and the cheese, good stuff. So I, I wish you luck. Try it now. If it if it's a souffle, John, when you put them in the oven and close it, should you then like leave the house so you don't make any loud noises to cause the souffle to crash? Huh. What you should do is yes. What you want to do is. Wear moccasins or <laughs> <laughs> or something very soft. Um, I, you know, I'm not a quiet guy, and I don't think I've ever made any of my concoctions fall. But how would I know? I just take them out and eat them. You know, maybe other people. <laughs> you know, um, and now that I think about it, I think really the the temperature should be three seventy five. Yeah. Uh, not three fifty. Do you put them on a pan? Do you put any water on the pan? Is it a water bath or just how do you like? You have little ramekins. Do they just go on a tray in the oven? And is there any water in that at all? You can you can do either one. I don't use the water, but I know lots of people who do, and there's yeah. good reasons for it. Yeah, um, I think I would use water if I was making uh, a souffle that had bits in it, like you know, vegetable, like you know, broccoli souffle or something you know i would uh, the, the water seems to be called for here i'm just i'm just uh bacon so yeah you know 18 to 22 minutes watch to see when the tops are puffed and golden brown and bob's your uncle S be careful slip them out carefully and transfer them into the mouths of your guests or let them do that to themselves. Yeah, that's probably better. It right? sounds absolutely delicious and i'm gonna try it okay I, I'm, I really i'm gonna try this and i Wanted to say, if people are weed intolerant, glute, gluten intolerant, you can use cornstarch, and you you can use arrowroot, and they would they could look up how to use it. It's a little bit of a different system, but there are ways to do that. Right, to those, make are, a root. those are thickening agents, and 
Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have to be flour. Uh, that's quite good. And right. I did once make these for a gluten intolerant person and intolerant uh. person. And so she tolerated it. Uh, so, <laughs> and did she love it? Uh, she really did love it. It's something different. And uh, people yeah. eat it the first couple of spoonfuls. They're thinking, what is this? What has John wrought? And then <laughs> they realize, oh, wait a minute. This is a thing. This is adult food. So, uh, what is your favorite cheese to use with it? Do you have a favorite? So, I love cheddar, of course, but if cheddar is the only one you're going to use, there's kind of a vulgar edge to cheddar that I'd like to sweeten with uh, Gruyere. I like a, a half and half okay. cheddar and, and Gruyere. Okay. I, I like that combination. Uh, it's just a little, I don't know, a little smoother and uh, Gruyere tastes better. Gruyere's delicious, yeah. Yeah, it's really nice. Yum. All right, I'm out of here. Okay. So so there's your, your pumpkin-based stuff. Uh, so take that, uh, pumpkin lattes and all that other good stuff. John, <laughs> John has come up with pumpkin souffle. Very good, John. Thank you. Yeah, I'm liking this one. This is not, this is going to be a try one on for me. Good luck to you. Thank you. I'll report back, of course. Good. Please. We'll be back to our podcast in just a moment, but first, here's a soothing musical interlude. Joy Stocky has established a reputation all over New Jersey and far and wide as an editor, publisher, and writer. She has written a book of poems, The Cave of the Bear, a travel memoir, Anatolian Days and Nights, a love affair with Turkey, Land of Dervishes, Goddesses, and Saints, and a cookbook, Tree of Life, Turkish Home Cooking. She also co-founded the highly regarded online journal Wild River Review, and with her team of editors and designers went on to co-found Tree of Life Consulting and Publishing, which is focused on cultural and cross-cultural histories and memoirs. For more about Joy, check out her Facebook page at facebook.com slash J-O-Y dot S-T-O-C-K-E or her LinkedIn page, that's linkedin.com slash I-N slash J-O-Y hyphen S-T-O-C-K-E hyphen 941-2B-66. And now we return you to the musical inner tube already in progress. Uh, to finish off your, your party, you may want a, a fun dessert. My wife and I made brownies for a, a local um, burrito chain in the central Pennsylvania area. And it's kind of a complicated reason why, but basically my son worked for them. And he volunteered my wife to make dessert <laughs> that these guys could sell. And uh, so she came up with uh, the idea to make brownies. And what we did was we took the half sheets, the baking, the baking half sheets that you usually use to make cookies, lined it with parchment paper, made this brownie batter, and uh, put it in the whole uh, half sheet and smoothed it out a little bit so that when you bake it, then when you take it out and let it cool, you can cut the, the brownies out of it. Uh, and because we were doing it uh, for uh, several different restaurants, we were coming up with about 300 of these a week. Wow. We would make three or four batches at a time. Uh, I remember we had uh, the first part of it, you start in a saucepan and then you work to bowls. We have four burners on our stove. We had four saucepans going, eight bowls because you, you do the mix, uh, the, the dry and the, and the uh, wet separately. This is the huge batch that we made to come up with huge batches of brownies. So if you want to make a normal batch, for a normal group of people, then you probably should cut it in half or maybe even quarter it if you're looking at a small group of people. And this has got, by the way, a lot of butter, a lot of sugar, a lot of chocolate. So if you're in any way trying to lose weight or not gain weight or diabetic or anything like that or gluten intolerant, you, you know, you're, you're probably going to want to have to uh, do a lot of substitutions in this. <laughs> in one saucepan, to make this big batch, we put in four sticks of butter. That's a whole box. Yum. We put in a baking bar. Now, you can get these at the store. They're bakers is the kind we use, but they're in the baking section, and it's unsweetened chocolate. 
you can get it in variations. They have sweetened and they have some others. You get the unsweetened ones because believe me, sweetness comes later. Um, you put in a tablespoon of vegetable oil and on top of all of that, 16 ounces of chocolate chips, just your regular chocolate chips. That all melts together, but you don't boil it. You have to leave it on a medium to low heat and let it all melt together. But you don't want to get it boiling or rapidly because that's that's going to destroy the chocolate. Then you have your mixing bowl with your uh, eggs. John, I chided you about putting a lot of eggs in your souffle. Um, we put six eggs in this bowl. Uh, uh, two and a quarter cups of sugar. That's about 18 ounces. Oh. Wow, that's a lot of sugar. Yeah, two tablespoons of vanilla and a teaspoon of salt. And so you whisk that egg mixture together. Then you put in the uh, chocolate mixture after you whisk the eggs together. And you might want to put in a little bit of the chocolate mixture and swirl it around with the eggs so that you don't make the eggs curdle. You don't get scrambled eggs. Then you add the rest of the pot of chocolate uh, until it starts to pull away from the sides of the bowl. And then you let it cool. Then you have the dry ingredients in another in another uh, bowl. You have one and a quarter cups of flour. You put in one tablespoon of baking powder. You can add these uh, to the, the flour if you want to really kind of jazz it up. But you can add white chocolate chips. Yum. Uh, some more chocolate chips if you want them in there. Or you could put in some walnuts. And then you put the chocolate mixture in to the flour mixture and you mix that together until there are no lumps in the flour. And then you uh, cut par- parchment paper to to match this, the size of this pan, whatever you're using. You can put the parchment paper down on either like spray uh, vegetable oil or you put a little butter on the bottom or whatever, but you want the parchment paper to eventually peel off that pan. Pour the batter in, use a, a spatula or or a knife or something to level it out. Bake in the oven at 325 for 12 minutes. Wow. Uh, now, we were using a convection oven, so I don't know, okay, Joy. Okay, you, you had it on convection at 3. So, 325. Yeah, I, I, Joy, I don't know if that would change for a regular oven. It does change. You want to put the regular oven to 350. Okay, but still 12 minutes? You'd have to test it. You know, convection okay. has air circula- circulating. Right. So, so uh, convection probably does it a little quicker. Well, they, and that's why you put it at 350. It, it cooks it more evenly, too, a convection oven, because it's right. got the heat circulating. Um, okay. You would, uh, if it were me um, and I didn't have convection, I'd do 350 for 12 minutes and then I'd test it. So you'll let us mm-hmm. know what the testing lets us know when they're done. Right. Well, and then what we would do is at that point, after the 12 minute point, we'd bring it out and you bang the pan a little bit to get the air bubbles out. Okay. So that everything settles. And then you would put it back in for about another six minutes. Okay. And then um, if they're done, you take them out and you cool on a rack for as long as you possibly can. When the brownies are warm, if you go to cut them, they're going to crumble. They're going to fall apart. So what you want to do is let them cool entirely. It would take at least 30 minutes, but probably. Better if you let it go for like uh, 45 minutes Wow, to cool off totally. Because again, we're talking about a big, so if you're doing a smaller pan, you would let them cool off for maybe 30 minutes. Can I interrupt with a question here? I have a question. Sure. Are these fudgy or chewy? Are they, I, I do let them cool because it's got to set a little bit more. And so they're more fudgy yeah, brownies. Yeah, you do because they are going to yeah, be yeah. fudgy. Okay. Yeah, they are going to be fudgy. They're not going to be right, cakey. Got it. They're going to be it. fudgy. Yeah, so that butter and everything. Right. And you, now you, and, you, again. and you have to bake them all the way through because if you don't bake them all the way through, put a toothpick in and when it comes out clean, right. then you know that they're done. You don't, then it's going to get soggy in the middle and it's going to collapse and you're going to have goo. Kind of like that goo, but. <laughs> well, they're going to be fudgy and they're going to chew. Uh, they're going to chew. Got they're it. not going to be yeah. cakey. Yeah. They're going to chew a little bit. Can you freeze brownies? I don't even know. Uh, yes, you can. You can freeze these, uh, and um, they will stay in the freezer for maybe about a week. That's it? You can't freeze them for longer? You know, I, we never did, really. I mean, we did make big batches, and sometimes we made them ahead of time, yeah. ahead of delivery, and we did freeze them, but we we were sending them out so quickly, pretty yeah. quickly. So I, we never really let them sit in the freezer for that much longer. But maybe, yeah, maybe up to a month or something. I don't know. Right. Um, we never let them stay that long. Well, would you reach in, like, do you guys ever freeze something like a brownie or cookies? This is my, my thing. I freeze them and then I'm reaching in to, 
oh, they're in the freezer. They're supposed to be for something else, but then you just want to. Maybe I'll take one out and <laughs> I know. taste it. Am I the only one who does no, that? No, we, no, it, no. It, no, you're not. Uh, we, like many people, froze our wedding cake. Mm. <laughs> and right. This was a very freezable cake. Um, and it's well known that uh, carrot cake uh, freezes well because it's extraordinarily yeah. moist. Yeah. And it, 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 it keeps its character fairly well. So we were told that you freeze your cake for a, a year and a day. A year. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and we did that. We, oh, we ate it and it was actually wonderful. And we cried because it reminded us of getting married. Isn't that Aww. sweet? Yeah. Aww, oh, yeah. I like that yeah, story. Yeah. yeah. And Christy looked at you and said, Oh God, I'm still married to this guy. I, said, I know. I never thought yeah. it would last this long or be this <laughs> hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, no. But, um, and now we ate the cake and it's going to last longer. <laughs> I've often frozen things and just forgot I put them there. Yeah, yeah. We all do that. And then, you know, when you're cleaning out the freezer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you and you, and you discover frozen lamb tort a la and it's frozen <laughs> and that's not going to work. Right now, what we we have frozen quite a bit of tomato sauce yeah, that from worked. the summer. That As worked. you know, there's yeah. quite a few tomatoes and it was great. But there's some things like... Eggplant dishes, well, eggplant parm freezes okay. Eggplants themselves, not so okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't freeze they don't freeze yeah, well yeah. at all. Um the the brownie recipe sounds truly delicious. It really does. And um, you know, the idea of the sugar, that's a lot of sugar in in the brownies. Yeah. But I look at it this way. The bittersweet chocolate or the just or the there's the you don't. You get Baker's chocolate with no sugar in it, right? Straight up chocolate. Right. That's right. Yeah. Right. So your counter. There's a reason. There's that much sugar. You know, we don't realize that when we make something with chocolate chips and all this kind of stuff, there's sugar and and things that we add along the way. So, um, so I'm I'm giving a shout out for the sugar. And besides, you're dividing it over a, a many many brownies. Yeah. So if if you if you're sugar adverse or if you're um, gluten adverse, you might want to think about you know replacing some of those things uh, with with adequate substitutes because yeah, there's a lot of sugar in it. There's a lot of flour. There are eggs and it. They're whole eggs. They're not just egg whites. So yeah, you're gonna you're gonna run into that, but. On the other hand, you only live once. <laughs> yeah. And after that, you really only live once in a day. <laughs> but I, I was, I, you know, I always think about something like stevia. What would happen if I tried it with stevia? And it might not work, but I, I'm, I'm willing. What, what we, uh, audience, what we said to Don, uh, John and I have been together many, many uh, Decembers. Um, for the Higa holiday, where we bake things because it's the holidays and uh, have a little wine with that, perhaps a little champagne, a little music. Um, but we're going to try Don's recipe this this year. And so what I think I might do, Don, is to try your reg regular recipe, cutting it in half, or maybe we'll make the whole thing because we share this. And then I might try a small amount, or we, because I'm putting the royal we on on you, John here. <laughs> uh oh, uh, try it with stevia and just see what happens. I'm curious absolutely. now. Absolutely, because I, I have you used stevia or or something uh, else like that in cooking before? Because I've been afraid to do it. I, I've used it in cookies, and it's it's worked out. It, you know, the flavor sugar adds a certain something. It worked okay in cookies, but brownies. The sugar's going to melt. And so I don't know what the texture would be. And I just thought we would try it. And if it's a failure, it's a delicious chocolate failure. We probably would still like it somehow. <laughs> yeah, you might. I don't know if Stevia also would add a little bit. I know some of the uh, artificial sweeteners add a, I want to say a tang. Chemically yeah, taste? Yeah, a tang Yeah, to yeah. It. So I don't know if the Stevia yeah, I know would do mean. that. Uh, I know Stevia is less chemical than some of the other sweeteners, but I still don't know. Yeah. I just want to try it and see. I really don't even care if it's a noble failure. Just be fun, right? Absolutely. And, you know, uh, I think we've just described one of the great uh, holiday noshes. We're going to have fun. Yeah. On our Higa I holiday. I think we're really going to have fun. And I'm I'm very excited to try the uh, pumpkin souffles as well. That sounds really delicious to me. I love pumpkin. I love squash. 
Yeah. And I, I did think one more thing with the souffle. You're talking about dried sage, not fresh sage. I have tons of fresh sage. Could I chop that fine and add oh, it? Oh, of course. Just of left, course you could. You know? I was going to say people put in other uh, things as well. Other things like, um, well, parsley. Yeah. Uh, you know, chop that fine. But, you know, sort of say that uh, if you're going to use X parsley, you'll take X away from the sage. Also, everybody likes to put in red red pepper, you know, for heat. Oh, yeah. And I would leave that up to the audience because I, I try to go easy so that we don't blow guests out of the house. You never know who can take it and who can't. Uh, the heat, I mean. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, uh, you can experiment. Sounds great to me. And before we sign off, are you guys dressing up for Halloween? Well, John has a face that you don't need to dress up, right? <laughs> that is true. <laughs> well, he's John. I'm going to not be, I'm going to be in a plane. Oh. I, no, I'm not. <laughs> okay. You'll be embodying the Day of the Dead when you get off that flight. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you have been mocked for death. <laughs> uh, All right. And hey, anybody who uh, is going to dress up for Halloween and have a little bash. There you go. You've got your tacos, and then you've got your souffle, and then you've got some brownies for dessert. And all of those recipes are on the website, musicalinnertube.com. I am on that website because I am cooking with gas, as my grandpa used to say. We love you, Joy Stocky. Thank you for uh, joining us once again. Thanks, Joy. Thank you guys for having me back. It's a real pleasure. And thank you for listening to the Musical Inner Tube. Hey, let us know how we're doing. Send us an email at musicalinnertube, all one word, at gmail.com. Do you know someone with a great story to tell? Let us know. Send us an email or log in to our website, musicalinnertube.com, and click on the microphone in the lower right-hand corner to leave us a voicemail. And while you're on our website, take a few minutes to listen to past episodes of the podcast. They're all there, along with pictures and biographies of our guests, blog posts, and lots more. And as always, our thanks to Virtual Band Car Radio Dog for providing us with our theme music. <laughs>